Hey, hey, what's going on, everyone? We are cruising through the football season week five, and we've got another edition of Auburn Head to Head for you in to break it down. Cole Kubik, he's with WJOX. You know, he just got off his radio show talking with Greg McElroy. He's also an SEC network, always has the game of the week matchup. And uh, one of the bigger games this week, obviously, Auburn uh, taking on LSU in Baton Rouge for a primetime matchup on ESPN. We are going to break this thing down, and we want to thank our sponsors before we get to it because we're going to keep Alabama beautiful. All right, Cole, so Auburn coming off uh, a win against Georgia State, 34-24. Of course, the score not indicative of how things went on on the field, not the prettiest uh, game for the Auburn Tigers. Obviously, the outcome, a win, a win is a win. But at the end of the day, there's a lot stirring and brewing there at Auburn after uh, you know what should have been a much easier win for the Auburn Tigers. And we'll start there. Auburn firing its wide receivers coach, Cornelius Williams, this week. That's a big storyline, just four games in. Also, the quarterback situation, uncertain of who will get the start on the road at Baton Rouge. Will it be Bo Nix? Uh, will it be TJ Finley as he makes his return to LSU, the LSU transfer? We're going to dive into this, and I just want to start. What, what, what is, in your mind, is the state of the program right now coming out of week four? Well, I think, obviously, there's some doubt about certain things. Auburn comes out. A little bit flat, slept walk through that game against Georgia State. One, like you mentioned, that they were a more talented football team. Should have handled their business, and we credited them so much for doing that in the first two games and just didn't come out and do it in this game. Uh, the receiver play hasn't been good, and mm -hmm. whether, it's been, whether it's been route running, whether it's been being able to get separation, understanding of certain things, it just it, it hasn't been great. And I think Brian Harson had a guy on staff that maybe he had more confidence in that he could push to that on-field role. And so he went ahead and made the move. Uh, I mean, I, I think he's proving right now that he's not afraid to make some difficult decisions when it comes to how people are going to handle themselves on this football team. I mean, look at the appearances of Tank Bigsby late in that game. He wasn't playing the way that he wanted him to. And so you didn't see a lot of him late in that game. Same thing with quarterback. It's a difficult decision to change quarterbacks in the middle of the season. Brian Harson felt like that was best for his football team. So he went ahead and made the move. None of these decisions are easy. And honestly, none of them really benefit your football team at the time. Now, you say bringing in a new quarterback maybe does, but that makes it more complicated for a lot of people because your playbook might shrink. You might not be able to do the things at the line of scrimmage that you're used to. So it makes things more complicated. But Brian Harson is showing folks, this is my team. I'm going to do it my way. And there's a standard that we expect people to live by, coach by, play by. And if you're not up to that, we're going to make difficult decisions. We're going to make changes. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest things that kind of came to me, I guess, in the post-game press conference is, you know, everybody wants to make this quarterback change a big storyline. The storyline, he says, is we have to get better. He's not going to give you – he's not going to show his hand. He's not going to say who's going to be the quarterback. These two guys are going to go out and compete this week. They're going to figure it out. And he said, look, bottom line is I don't even need to tell you my game plan. We're going to go in, figure things out. We'll see who comes out. Um, as the starting quarterback, you know, Nick's unfortunately uh, just not on the same page with his receivers. We saw him a lot of misfires downfield. It just seemed like there was a lot of lack of inconsistency and in, in much of what we saw from Bo Nix in year one and year two. And you said it earlier in the year, Bo Nix, you want to see him being a quarterback. And, 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 and obviously we've seen, you know, out of the gates, a, a much more mature quarterback and even Bo Nix going to Penn State, going to a tough, uh, you know, environment, playing relatively well with what he was up against. And that's going to be the same thing when they go to Baton Rouge. They're going to Baton Rouge and have not won in Baton Rouge since 1999. And so I think that obviously factors in who's going to be able to manage this offense. And Cole, I guess from your standpoint, I want to know as someone that ha has been there, has played on the line, understands what these competitions look like, how does this impact and affect the, the confidence of a quarterback? on both sides, whether you're Bo Nix or you're TJ Finley, when that decision is ultimately made before kick time on Saturday. Well, I think anybody's confidence takes a bit of a hit when you're benched. I've, I've been benched. It's not fun. It's not easy. Um, how how you handle yourself afterwards is, is even more difficult, especially around your teammates, around the facility. 
And I don't think being benched defines you. I, I don't think that defines what you are as a player or a person. After you're benched, I think can go very far in defining what you are as a teammate, what you are as an individual, what you are as a person, and what you were as a football player for wherever you're playing. So I, there were some bad habits that showed their face again. Um, lack of setting the feet. Uh, it looked like Bo Nix was a little bit concerned about getting hit low a few times. And that was, the protection has not been great. And that's not just the offensive line. The running backs haven't been really good in protection. The tight ends haven't always been great in protection. Um, so I, I think that it's it's a collective issue. It's, you can't point at one guy, one group, one thing, and say, this is why that part of this football team is not having success. I'm more concerned with how things were handled after the change of quarterback took place. Because I think you go one of two ways here, and that is that you have a guy that removed himself from his teammates for the majority of the rest of that football game. And for nobody else to go grab him and say, you need to be over here with us, you need to be over here with your quarterback, it tells me one of two things. There's either not enough leadership on that team to go make that move and to go get him and grab him and pull him back, or there's nobody on that team that wants to go do it, which would be an even bigger problem. And I don't know what it is. I, 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 I'm I not there every day. I'm not in the meeting rooms. I'm not in the facility. I don't put a uniform on with those guys. So I, I can't tell you exactly how that's happening. But the fact that that's even a real point of discussion tells me that it is somewhat of an issue and it's something that has to get fixed moving forward. Look, we've got a, a, a quarterback in Max Johnson. He has been great for LSU so far. Um, stat line pretty much speaks for itself. 15 touchdowns, 1,160 yards. And I think he's completing about 65% right now of his passes. I think he continues to improve. He's shown improvement throughout the season. Um, you know, he's got the receiving core around him and perhaps one of the best receivers in the country. Two guys I'm concerned about is, is, is this Kayshawn kid and also Trey Palmer. I think they can get things done through the air. Uh, so from a defensive standpoint, um, you know, the Tigers, uh, the Auburn Tigers, I should say, have been effective in, in stopping the run. They've done a pretty solid job of that. But what concerns me more is what this LSU team, LSU team can do explosively through the air. And I think that's going to be a big point of contention going into this one, especially under the lights in Baton Rouge uh, with all the other distractions and things that are kind of in shift and in motion uh, for this Auburn football team. Well, first off, do you, you get an SEC West opponent that comes to your stadium, that's going to be a big deal. Then you add on the fact that this streak that we're in the middle of, no LSU fan or player is going to want that to end. And on top of that, through COVID, we haven't seen this stadium be what it's truly capable of being in quite some time. I mean, the, the big season opener, obviously, against LSU is on the road. So I think this is the first game in pushing two years that we are going to see this stadium have the potential to be what we know it to be. And that is one of the loudest in college football, one of the most difficult environments to play in college football. Then you go into some of the matchups that you brought on, and yeah, it's it's a pretty good group of receivers. Trey Palmer gets back against Mississippi State. Keyshawn Butte, I think, is the best receiver in college football. You saw Cole Taylor with the big touchdown pass late. He's a tight end that I've anticipated was going to have a big year for LSU. He's kind of beginning to show up a little bit. The good news from that perspective is Max Johnson at times is still not on the same page with Jake Pete, the offensive coordinator, his offensive line, his back's tight ends of where the hots are, what the protection is, when to get the ball out, and exactly what he has in front of him. Derek Mason has to take advantage of that. You've got to show different things, bring different things. Auburn will have to be more pressure-laden in this game than they've been in any game this season. Hell, maybe more so than the first four games combined in this season. That's just what they're going to have to be to be able to get to him and force him into some mistakes because he will make them. And that doesn't mean interceptions or pick sixes. It just means incompletions. Moving around. I mean, hell, we saw him throw a ball like underhand, fast pitch, Jenny Finch behind his back sideways <laughs> against UCLA. And you've got to force him into those situations so the other players that you referenced can't get going 
and can't be extremely effective in this game because even some of the younger players at running back and receiver at times have stepped up and made plays for this LSU football team. Mm -hmm. The offensive line's not playing great ball right now. And if the quarterback's not 100% sure of what needs to be where and how it needs to get there, you have to take advantage of that. All right. We get into our predictions, all great insight. And Cole, you, you 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 hit the nail on the head, the environment, and bringing that into perspective when you think about a stadium that has has, has essentially, you know, been been tamed with, with COVID and having to go through that. I think that in this environment, you've played in it, you get it, you understand it. I think that this is going to be uh, a, a big time battle for this Auburn football team. I think that they're going to need to run the ball effectively like they have been behind Tank Bigsby, Darquez Hunter. You mentioned it, Tank did not run the football especially well in this last matchup. He's going to have to be especially well in this one. And then, of course, defensively, I think that they're going to have to bring pressure on the quarterback, get him out of rhythm, obviously, you know, take away those explosives. And so I still think the environment wins in this one. I do think LSU is going to extend that streak uh, that they've had since 1999. I got LSU winning this one 28-24. Yeah, it's it's painful for me to say that I was actually in a uniform the last time that, that Auburn won in that stadium. And I've, I've been to that stadium a lot of times since. What? It's a it's an amazing place to go watch a football game, and we had a couple amazing games when I played uh, in that stadium, and it just hasn't happened since. I don't want that streak to continue. It's obviously one that people bring up with me a lot, and it, they, for some reason, think that I'm proud of it, and I'm not. But I just think that LSU's got a little bit too much, especially from a matchup perspective here in this game. You mentioned the environment. That's going to be a big piece of it. Communication is going to be a problem. Uh, I think what you have to have to give this LSU defense problems is going to be a lot of misdirection, a lot of commotion behind the line of scrimmage. If you go back and look at what Chip Kelly did, he formationed the hell out of LSU. It's one of the reasons they had trouble lining up and then finding the football player. Um, I think mobile quarterback could be big. That's where Bo Nix maybe could be of big benefit for this Auburn offense. But whether it's split zone, whether it's reads, whether it's play actions, bootlegs, throwbacks, screens, all of those things have to be happening if Auburn's going to find any success offensively outside of Tank Bigsby getting going against a really good front seven. I just find it hard to believe that there's going to be a ton of offense generated for the Auburn Tigers in this game. I'm going to go 27-14. I think LSU gets the win. I don't think Auburn can find a ton on offense, and I think LSU finds just enough offensively to be able to find a win and unfortunately keep this streak going to Baton Rouge. Talking a little trash on the field? Yeah, we get it. Trashing the state with litter? That's terrible. Keep it clean, keep Alabama beautiful. It's guaranteed that I die legend. Yeah, son God, homie, I'm revenue. Great, just protecting my investment. Escobar, me, integrity's not a...